Thanks for coming. I know it's a busy, busy period here at JMSC, but uh, I know you can get a good turnout because our guest needs no introduction. Uh, Christy Lou Stout started out at Stanford for her bachelor and master's degrees before going to uh, Beijing, where she studied Mandarin at Tsinghua University. Uh, but you probably best know her from uh, CNN. But I should say she did get there via a tech route. She was actually uh, probably proudly would call herself a, uh, a digital nerd or a tech nerd. Uh, she was working doing some stuff for Wired magazine and even the South China Morning Post here before ending up at CNN, where you probably know her as the anchor of the Newsstream show that's on at 8 p.m. That kind of melds journalism and digital technology in innovative new ways. And she also started on China, which is I think the only international TV broadcast dedicated specifically to China on a major uh, television network. And uh, she's also uh, you know, probably describes herself as a mom and an internet geek. So uh, without further ado, and I'm sure you're going to hear some uh, great inspiring stories here, uh, can I introduce Kristen Gustav? Thank you so much for that kind introduction. Um, and I'm really happy to be back here at Hong Kong University and to speak to the next generation of journalists in this room. Um, I have to admit, when he asked me to give another speech, I was thinking, what should I talk about this time? This year has been a very interesting year in terms of journalism because the story has been focused, let's face it, outside the region. Um, it has been all about the US election. It has been all about Brexit. It has been all about the war against ISIS and terrorism. And it's all, been all about the feature story of the year, um, the Olympics in Brazil. So I thought, well, why not give a speech about how to give an effective speech? Um, so this is what I'm going to be going through in the next 30 minutes or so. We can break down into Q&A on, on how to give an effective speech. Because no matter if you find yourself becoming a broadcast journalist, or even working in the corporate world, or even academia, you're going to find yourself in a position where you're going to have to stand and deliver. Um, so, you know, a little bit about my work. Giving a speech is what I do as an anchor correspondent for CNN. So I could be every night I'm on air, 8 p.m. live Hong Kong time. That's going to change starting Monday because of daylight savings in the United States. Long story, we are a U.S.-based media company, so we're going to be starting at 9 p.m. Hong Kong time on Monday for Newsstream. So I'm on air one hour every day live from Hong Kong. It's a global news broadcast. In addition to that, I do feature work for um, CNN, work for CNN Digital, and also I do a lot of moderating and speaking appearances, like the recent um, moderating conference I did with Elon Musk, the serial entrepreneur, um, or going on location in Taiwan to talk about the election of the new Taiwan president, or, and that was interesting, going up to Beijing to talk to Anna Wintour about her thoughts about the fashion industry in China. Um, outside of work, I regularly give speeches, including to you, Hong Kong University students. This is um, a series of photos taken by one of your fellow students last year. And I'm going to let you in on a secret. I don't like public speaking. It's not something that I was born to do. I, it's, I don't have a natural talent in it. I am what is known, and this is a proper psychological term, an extroverted introvert. Um, You've probably read the book Quiet by Susan Cain or seen the TED Talk. A number of you are shaking your heads. We have some introverts here in the room. Um, when I was a little girl, my dream was to be a librarian, not <laughs> a international broadcaster. No, I'm serious. I used to line up all my books and create little card catalog cards inside and ask my sister if she wanted to come in and check out a book. Inevitably, she did it. She would much rather play something else. Um, I would much rather be staying at home reading a book than going out to a cocktail party. That's just who I am. But over the years, starting from when I was in high school, I forced myself to give speeches. I forced myself to go into drama, into speech and debate, into student radio, university, and even working at CNN in my off time giving public speeches so I could hone the skill. I've clocked in hundreds of hours in public speaking, and as a result, I've learned to hack it as a public speaker. And that's what I wanted to share with you today, sort of a little bit of the tricks of the trade that I've picked up and continue to pick up about public speaking so you can also be an effective public speaker. So why? Why? Um, I believe a speech can make an impact, and I also believe that a speech can change your life because it changed mine. In year 2000, this was 16 years ago, I was visiting Hong Kong, then uh, working in Beijing in the the internet technology industry. I always wanted to be a journalist, but the door was always closed. Um, every time I get an opportunity, 
it was in the wrong market, the pay wasn't high enough for me to be able to afford um, uh, life <laughs> and to pay off my um, student expenses or my student loans. And so I worked in PR instead, but in the um, technology industry. But what had happened is I became sort of a reporter on Embed inside a nascent, um, very successful internet company at the time called Sogu, Sogu.com. I was one of the early hires there. So while I was working at Sogu, I was also writing and reporting about the internet and technology development in China in the late 1990s. So I became a little bit of a commentator. Um, so when I came to Hong Kong in 2000, I was invited by the Foreign Correspondents Club to give a speech about internet trends in China. And I didn't know it would be, at the time, a speech that would change my life, but it did, because there was a senior producer from CNN in the audience who saw me speak and decided to give me a chance. And she said, we want to book you as a guest tonight. And are you available to talk about the internet in China for this material? I said, yes. I was invited again. CNBC called me. And then finally, I got this job opportunity that was my dream job that I never imagined I'd be able to get that fused my interest in China and technology and media. Um, all because of the speech. So I believe really that you have to learn how to give a, a, and to deliver a powerful speech because the speech can change your life. And as we've seen in this political campaign cycle, speech can also change the tone of a campaign. <coughs> Michelle Obama, I mean, look, partisan politics aside, um, she really has been the one who's delivered some incredible examples of oratory. Um, really memorable stuff that we're going to remember far beyond this election cycle. And we're going to dig into that a little bit later on. Um, but we will go back to Michelle Obama and her, and her, and her oratory and the powerful um, speeches she's been making in just a moment. But what we're going to be doing now is talking about three things. First, how to craft an effective speech. Secondly, how to deliver an effective speech. And lastly, how to get over the fear factor. Because let's face it, we all get scared. Um, even the people you think don't look like they get scared, they do need to get psyched out, pepped up, and to deliver that speech. Okay, crafting the message, always be prepared. This is my favorite quote by Mark Twain. He said, quote, it usually takes more than three weeks to prepare a good and prompt speech. And it's absolutely true. When you see someone give an amazing speech, there's usually a lot of work behind it. Um, Michelle Obama's oratory, that has a team behind it and weeks and weeks of preparation and practice behind that speech. So if you want to make and deliver that effective speech, always remember, you have to always be prepared. And when you start writing the speech, the first thing you need to do is realize who is your audience, because it's all about them. I don't know about you, but there's so many times I've attended a conference, or went to a luncheon, or went to a panel discussion at the FCC or elsewhere, and was just bored out of my mind. And thought, you are wasting my time. This is not what I came here to listen to. I can't believe we're being dragged through this. And I start feeling, it's it's almost an insult if, and, and gosh, it's, it's kind of risky for me to say that because what if some of you have a thought bubble above your head right now saying, well, Christy, I feel insulted right now. <laughs> what you're talking about. But it's, as, a, as, a, as, as someone who's been invited to address an audience, you really have to be extremely mindful um, about the needs of the audience. This is the reason why you're here. It's not about yourself and advancing your brand or what have you. It, it's about trying to figure out your audience, what they want, and to give them what they want. Is there a problem that they want to solve? We have to frame the speech and address around them. Crafting the message. There is this really um, interesting work by a linguist named Paul Grice, and it's something called the Cooperative Principle. And this is um, a linguistic theory about the tenets of effective social communication, or one would even say polite conversation. There are four maxims, um, quantity, quality, relevance, and manner. Basically, if you want to be an effective social communicator, you have to remember all four things. In terms of quantity, um, you want to make sure your speech is as informative as required. No more, no less. Quality, uh, of course, uh, we're all journalists in this room, we're journalists in training. Anything that you report on, anything that you share with an audience, you have to back it up. Okay. Relevance. You want to make it relevant to the time. Maybe you have that deck of slides or presentation that you've been giving for a while. Maybe it's time to refresh it with um, some uh, something from the news cycle or with pop culture references or latest advances in technology. You always have to be relevant to the moment. And lastly, manner. You want to be direct. You want to be brief and orderly. 
And I put a little picture of David Brett from the office at the bottom. Basically, you don't want to be a David Brett. I mean, he is the classic example of someone who thinks giving a speech is all about himself. He's the exact opposite of being brief and orderly. Um, you don't. You want to be the antithesis of him, basically, when you give a speech. When you deliver the message, you always have to be prepared. This is something that a lot of people forget about in terms of the room and the setup. And this is key if you're going to give that keynote address. You want to do a recce or have, if you're working for a company, a publicist or a colleague or an assistant or even yourself to go into the room and just check out the situation. How large is the room going to be? How many people are going to be there? Um, who's going to be attending the audience, of course, because that affects how you're going to write your message. Are you going to be sitting or are you going to be at the podium? This is also very key for, let's face it, um, female speakers. If you're going to be sitting, um, you may not want to be wearing a skirt. Um, if you're going to be standing at a podium, how comfortable do you feel standing at the podium? And there may be a certain expectation that you're going to give a more formal, maybe type of commencement type speech, as opposed to an informal speech where you're sitting on a sofa. Um, you, you may not want to take notes with you, or if you do want to take notes, you can index cards. Um, if you're, there's going to be a podium, you want to practice at the podium if you can. And if there's no podium, you may want to practice speaking without the podium. Uh, every night in Newstream, um, I anchor a news program without an anchor desk. Um, and it's something I feel very comfortable about. It's, it's strange for, for other colleagues and other news anchors, you can sometimes see it on air that they feel uncomfortable when they're standing and delivering news. They feel much more comfortable when they're at the anchor desk. Um, oftentimes they're holding, clutching a bunch of papers that they're never going to refer to, and they're holding it like this, and the camera is looking at them, and you can tell that they're just physically uncomfortable with that position. So if you're going to be put in a place, whether it's a speech or a live news broadcast, what have you, try to imagine how you're going to be giving that message and build up that confidence and you feel comfortable around that. On the flip side, because I'm so used to anchoring and literally standing and delivering a news bulletin every night, when I do sit and deliver the news in anchor desk, sometimes I get too casual. Recently I found myself, because it's been a while, sitting in an anchor desk and it started slouching because I thought, well, I'm sitting, I can relax, here are the papers, and I quickly saw myself with the return camera, I was like, oh my goodness, that's not the formal presenter I'm supposed to be, and I'm not really giving the authority and the gravitas that's necessary for the story. So, you know, it goes both ways, but you have to be mindful of, of how the setup will affect your message. Um, also, are you going to have a microphone or not? Um, for this room, no need for a microphone, even though I do have to carry my voice a little bit. Um, but if there's going to be a hand microphone, how is that going to affect you carrying your iPad or your iPhone or your notes? Um, or if it's going to be a wireless microphone, again, for the ladies, you have to clip it somewhere. If you're wearing a dress, what are you going to do? Um, you may want to choose to wear a blazer instead. So, you know, all these things you have to consider. Um, before you're invited to, to, to be a panelist or, just, or uh, a keynote um, speaker at a, at a major event. And always practice. Practice your speech. Michelle Obama is said to practice her speech weeks in advance, word for word, and very rarely asks for last minute changes. Always practice. If it's a very big speech that you're going to give, let's say you're going to be invited to do a TEDx speech or representing the student body for a big Hong Kong University speech where dozens of people or maybe 100 plus people will be in attendance, you may want to consider videotaping yourself. Um, I've been working at CNN, this is my 15th year at CNN, and I still watch, and it's very uncomfortable for me still, videotapes of me presenting and delivering the news. I'm always constantly critiquing my gestures, my posture, my tone of voice. If, I, if my mannerism is appropriate for the story at hand, it's, it's something that you have to know. And, you know to be, to be a, a, an effective speaker, to try to imagine someone else looking at you, judging you, figuring out if, if the message is going to come through. Um, you have to be mindful of articulation. What I mean by articulation is not only being able to pronounce each word with clarity, but also proper pronunciation. Earlier this week, um, we had the big news breaking out of South Korea, the South Korean presidential scandal. We already know how to pronounce Park and Kay, but the name of her Rasputin-like um, uh, confidant, Chi Sun-shil, 
is something that, that required a little bit of reading up on. And so the anchors started sharing this. This is how you pronounce the name. And I had to turn to Sol Han, a former graduate of the GMSC program, and she said, yes, indeed, that's how you pronounce it. So it's very important to nail down those pronunciations. And you can either pick up a phone, talk to a friend, or even go to YouTube. This is your program guides there. Stress and intonation is very important. Um, what I mean by stress and intonation, of course, is when you give a speech, focusing on which word that you want to emphasize. Um, and intonation is very key, especially, and I hate to say this, but it also applies to myself, um, a, number of, um, young, a number of young women in this room. There has been this tendency over the last few decades for women to speak and to end the sentence with a rising tone. I come from Silicon Valley, and that's just the way we talk to each other. And it's because, you know, we connect to each other, and that's just the way it is. Um, and I've had to really learn how to control that. Because your natural intonation and the way you commune with the girlfriends can actually undercut your authority and your gravitas. Um, early on in my career as a news anchor, and I had to, this is before social media, my goodness, I wonder what it would be like if it, social media was in its heyday that then, but I had to deal with um, letters and emails from people saying, you're too young, you have no authority, why should I listen to you? And this was when I just started as an anchor. I was like, gosh, can I do this? And I had to figure out some tricks to be able to insert some authority into my voice and my presentation. So one thing I did was, I had to get rid of that rising tone and tension right away. Another thing that I did was, oh, and to the extent that even today, when I start a broadcast with a question, like, um, let's say, Iraqi forces have finally entered Mosul City. When will they retake the, when will they retake the city? Or, Iraqi forces have finally entered Mosul. When will they retake the city? It's a question mark. But instead of reading it like Ron Burgundy, <laughs> when will they retake the city? Um, it's always a, a downward tone. And it's still a question, but it just sounds like it has more of an impact. And uh, this is something that just works with me. Also, a another personal quirk of mine. I don't use contractions, even though I just use one. Uh, <laughs> when I'm on air, I do not use contractions. So when I'm speaking to you, it's much more casual. Um, when I'm on air, I would, I, I would prefer to say he did not address the audience that way, as opposed to he didn't address them that way. Unless it's a kicker story or something I feel that's a little bit more casual and I can insert a little bit of, I don't know, attitude or casualness into it. So you, you find these little tricks along the way, but just be wary of this. Um, and, and I know that this is unfair. Um, I've met a number of, you know, all of us, so many of you in this room, really talented, intelligent young men and young women who maybe it's just because of the way you look or the way you sound, or the way you gesticulate, people don't think that you're the real deal, or you have something to say, right? And we can complain and say, that's not fair. I, I think you have to be aware of it. The thinking is out there. And you have to hijack that to your benefit and find a way to hack that so you can be able to present the best version of you to, to, to get yourself heard. I think that's the most important thing. Um, that being said, the last bullet point there, you have to keep it conversational. And this is the challenge of being a, a news anchor and being on air these days is on one hand you have to be authoritative, on the other hand you have to be approachable. You have to have the gravitas, but you also have to feel like you're directly communicating with one of you on the other side of the camera. Um, and you have to find those appropriate moments to let your personality emerge. But the news is always the star, not you. So it's always a, a delicate balance there. Um, what I do when I'm live on air is I imagine myself a more formal persona, a formal version of myself, speaking and addressing news to one person. So I'll be looking down the camera, but I'll be imagining a certain person I'm talking to that night. Um, and that always helps me. And lastly, it's true, you have to get pumped. You have to somehow get yourself psyched up to give that big address. Um, I put a screen grab from Bill Pullman from the original Independence Day movie, which was so much better than the script that came out a couple months ago. Because I have a producer at CNN who thinks this is the most inspiring speech in the world. And every day, without fail, on July 4th, he pulls it up on YouTube, and he listens to it, and he gets pumped. 
Um, so maybe it's not the Bill Pullman speech from Independence Day for you, but maybe it's something else. There was this great photo at the, um, that was taken earlier this year at the Democratic National Convention of President Barack Obama. He had earbuds in, and he was listening to something before his big speech. This is POTUS. He is already the most powerful man in the world. He needs to get pumped in sight before his big speech. Later on, a journalist asked him, what were you listening to? D does anybody here know? He was listening to Lose Yourself by Eminem. <laughs> And it's funny because, I don't know, it's a great pump-up song. Yeah. In fact, I used it myself. There's a couple moments. It, it, also, the song came out at the time when I just started my career as an anchor. And I was thinking, oh, I need to get pumped. What am I going to do? And then, you know, just a mile came out. Like, this is the song for me. Sometimes you need something like that. Um, you may remember at the actual event or the memes of Michael Phelps. And at the Rio Games, and he's sitting by the pool with his earbuds in, and he's giving it looks like a death stare to his South African rival. <laughs> and it turned into, you know, people put laser beams through his eyes, and you know, became, the internet became the internet, and you know, memes all over the place. He was listening to Skrillex. Okay, so maybe it's old school Eminem, maybe it's Skrillex, maybe it's Bill Pullman from Independence Day, you know, find it, or maybe it's talking to a friend who's really good at pumping you up. Um, it's before that big speech, it's really important for you to be in the right mental zone so you are psyched to be the best version of yourself. Uh, body mess, body language, <laughs> very important. Uh, one thing I've really enjoyed um, covering and watching the U.S. election is when they trot out the body language experts after the debates. Uh, it's, it, it, it's, I want, uh, it's hilarious, but it's also very revealing. I remember this moment, and I wasn't the only one, because remember I saw that, and then we were talking about this. You're watching the debate, and then you're also um, watching the conversation, the chat on Twitter at the same time. And when this moment happened, I said, the optics are really bad, because this came out right after the Access Hollywood videotape was leaked of Donald Trump saying, I, because I'm famous, I can get money. And so when this moment was on air, I said, whoa, am I the only person who thinks that this is a little bit creepy looking? <laughs> and sure enough, everybody else on Twitter was going, whoa, did you see that? Look at that, wow. Body language experts said what happened here was that Donald Trump was nervous, so he was pacing around. <laughs> Hillary Clinton, who was extremely well prepared, even down to her body language, um, when she was addressing a, um, a, 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 someone who was asking a question in the town hall, she moved from her position, um, crossed over to Donald Trump's territory on the stage to be right next to um, the American voter and started talking, talking to the person. So he had nowhere to go so but to kind of wander around behind her, which is why he looks like he's on the prowl. Um, but body language is kind of, oh, and then People Magazine, of all sources, yesterday, um, they got an interview with Hillary Clinton, and she said that she practiced her listening face. Um, you remember during the split screen, Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, and during the first, especially the first debate, poor Donald Trump, he was sniffing, he kept drinking water, etc. Cetera, et cetera. He looked really, really nervous, and Hillary Clinton seemed calm and in control, and a lot of people said she won that debate. Um, and he, there was a New York Times journalist who was tasked with covering the debate with the audio turned all the way down, just trying to figure out who won based on body language as well. Body language is, is that important. Um, when I first started anchoring, one of my co-anchors gave me a really interesting book. It was called The Definitive Book of Body Language by Barbara Pease. And I read it with much interest. And it did talk about how the way you present yourself can give intentionally or unintentionally a certain message to people who are watching you. Um, so for example, having your arms closed like this can make you look a little bit suspicious, sketchy, closed off, not really approachable. If you feel inclined to have this pose, just opening it up like this and just look a little bit more authoritative and open. I don't do this pose when I'm on air because I think it's too posy. <laughs> um, but you know, when you do have to pose for that photograph, there's, inevitably, you'll see one of my photos is me going. 
and if you guys are remember from this, you can't go like this. But this, done. And I hate posing for photographs, believe me. But it's you have to come up with your repertoire. Um, you've probably seen the TEDx talk about the power pose and fake it till you make it. Yeah. Um, and even though I really like that message, and there is a little bit, and I'm going to get into that a little bit later, imposter syndrome, feeling why am I here? Um, and if body language does help you with that, you know, go for it. I just feel this is a little bit, for me, it feels a little bit like a, I'm trying too hard to be Wonder Woman, it feels a little bit false. Um, but if it works for you, and you feel natural, and you look at a videotape of yourself doing it, by all means, do it, it's great. Um, for the men in the audience, be careful when you stand in public and go like this, because it looks like you're defensive and you're afraid someone's going to kick you. <laughs> <laughs> right, you know, no, really, it's, this is all written in the book. This is all, I'm quoting body language experts here. It just looks like you're, you're, being, you're kind of wary about what's going to happen next. Right? So it's, it, look, you know, it's, what I'm trying to bring up here is not saying, oh, I need to do this and act like this. Just be aware of how it, your body language is important. So, for example, on air, I've had to learn over the years not to just stipulate Silicon Valley girl style. You know, if you do fingers open, you lose a lot of credibility. <laughs> but if you gesture like this, and it just looks a little bit more authority. Um, my own personal style, not, when I'm on air, this is a different version of myself when I'm on air, is I, I use far less gestures. And I only gesture when I really want to show something to the audience, look at this photo right over here, or three million people, you know, just, but I, I don't like to gesture too much. That's my own personal style. You may know Richard Quest, who is fantastic at what he does, and he's very bold and flamboyant, and he throws gestures all over the place, but that's him and his persona, and it works for him. So, and over the years, he's developed that persona, and I've developed mine, and you have developed yours, you're in the process of developing yours, so just be aware of that. Oh yeah, and back to videotaping yourself, another key point about that was early on when I started anchoring, some colleagues were pointing out some nervous tics that I had that I was not even aware of. Um, one of them is I, I used to do these tech watch segments as a technology course of mine, and I would show up, sit down next to the anchor, and have a conversation back and forth about you know, a given news story. And um, a, uh, a, a uh, tech operations colleague pulled me aside and said, Christy, every time you finish a sentence, you always tap the lap. So, you know, I'd say, and that's why, that's why Bonte Aileen is making this $1 billion investment in Dick Park Productions. You know, I would, I would always just, period. And I had no idea I was doing this. And he pointed out, and then I watched the, the tape again, thinking, oh my goodness, that's really distracting, and it looks ridiculous. So then I had to force myself to, to undo that. Um, another nervous tick I had was I always just wiggle my pencil. I'd have my pencil with me or my pen, and I'd just wiggle it back and forth, and I had no idea that I was doing it. <laughs> you're, you're clicking your pen. <laughs> um, <laughs> there we go, yeah, or spinning the pen. Because I was, uh, maybe it's because just in, in college or what have you, I always just took, and, and um, another producer pulled me aside and said, you've got to use the pen. And sometimes it takes good colleagues to come up to you to point something out. And it also takes a little bit of humility on your part and being able to laugh at yourself when someone points something out. You're like, do you know what? You're right. My bad. I'm going to work on that. Um, and yes, wardrobe matters. Um, and look. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, you don't want to wear a green dress on the green screen because you look like a disembodied head. Um, and I'll just go through wardrobe. And, and you know, it's. And it, it's very annoying to talk about wardrobe because I, I think there's too much emphasis in today's society about styling and everything else. But I do believe in uniforms, and there are uniforms that are appropriate for your work, and there are uniforms that are appropriate for when you present yourself and make a presentation. You don't want to wear anything that will startle or rattle, um, you know, big, clingy jewelry, um, or blend into the background. I think there's a reason why Ken Bone became Ken Bone, because he was wearing that bright red sweater. I mean, it was also the question that he answered at the last presidential debate. Um, but wearing bright red, he, he walked into that room because he wanted to be noticed. Um, you want to wear clothes clean cut, good lines, patterns discouraged. You don't want to overdo the makeup. Unfortunately, on TV, um, this applies to um, 
male anchors as well, if you're going to have the harsh light on you, um, you have to put on makeup that makes you look like a natural version of yourself. You have, that's just that's just the way the medium works. Um, but where matters, are you going to be standing for a long period of time, giving a speech, um, you may not want to wear your high heel shoes, etc. And you want to be, this, this I think is the most important part, is you want to be mindful of the psychology of the choice of your wardrobe. And <clears throat> what do I mean by that? Um, for example, years ago I had a colleague covering the red shirt protest in Thailand and he was wearing a red Lacoste shirt. So we had to tell him to change his shirt. Um, or even during the height of the umbrella movement and a colleague showed up in a yellow blouse in Admiralty and said, you know what, you, know, you need to change that. Um, just two weeks ago we were reporting on the anticipated death of the Thai king and I intentionally wore a pink dress which is a color of healing, it's, it's a wish for healing for the Thai king. And then we started getting the early reports that he may have passed. And I had that one dress, I always buy multiples because I hate shopping. I had that one dress in dark navy blue and pink. I brought both colors and changed them to the navy. The news of his death broke just when we went on um, live on air from the stream. And it, it's, and it, 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 it makes a difference. It, it's, it's a mark of respect. So you have to understand the tone of, and what the psychology of color, or even the choice of your wardrobe, what it can convey. Melania Trump, there was that huge debate about whether she wore the pussy bow blouse on purpose um, at the last debate, this pink Gucci pussy bow, um, bow blouse, on the back of her husband making these comments about grabbing women by the middle like beginning with the letter P. Um, you know, it's, that might be overreach, but we are living in a society that everyone is online and monitoring, and if you're going to be giving a very high profile speech, you have to be aware that people are going to be digging into those kind of details. Everybody has imposter syndrome at one time or another in their career. Everybody gets scared. It is just, it's, it's, a, it's a natural human reaction if you're going to be standing in front of a bunch of people. We're social animals. We know that we're going to be judged. Um, so how do you get over the fear? I want to say you've got to practice and practice and practice until it becomes your team. Again, Michelle Obama practicing her speech again and again and again and again, week, word for word, weeks before the actual moment when she has to give that speech until it just becomes procedural knowledge. Um, learn how to relax. I mean, it's, this is something you, you've been learning already, trying to get through high school and, and at university. You know, it, Whatever it is, if it's exercise, if it's meditation and mindfulness, um, and also find that moment to be alone. If there's, there's usually a, something called a green room that they have in newsrooms, that they have if you go, one day you're going to go to the Jimmy Kimmel show, and then you can go into the green room beforehand, or even at a big conference center, they have a green room off to the side. Or you could ask the organizer, is there an area or a space where I could just be by myself for a couple minutes? So I could think, go over my notes, or just, you know, mental note to yourself, just breathe in and out so I can be in the right place when I give this speech. That's important to you. But one thing that I think is very helpful for me every time, especially when I give a big keynote type address, is to always be prepared and to believe in yourself and your message. Because you're giving a message with the intention to somehow inform or to help the people in the audience. I think when you, when you take the focus off of yourself and onto how you can help other people, it's very calming and it, it removes the anxiety right away. And there's always the pep talk. And if you have a pep talk posse, or that pep talk playlist, you know, whatever the song is, it's Eminem or Skrillex, right? Maybe that works for you. It works for POTUS, find out what works for you. But for me, and I, I put it in all red, it's really the words that I am here to serve. In fact, every night before I go live on air, um, I think of those words. Um, I try to take out, you know, the focus away from me and just the, it, the news is the star, I'm here to serve, this is the you know, amazing rundown that my team and I have put together using the best of CNN's international roster correspondence and footage to be able to present the world in the most compelling way possible for our audience. And let's go. So let's go back to Shilvana. Again, partisan politics aside, I think in this election cycle, when people will talk about the most memorable speeches, years and years from now, they will talk about Michelle Obama's speeches. And in her most recent speech, that was when she talked about the need for going back to and emphasizing basic human decency, 
about right and wrong. She spoke with genuine emotion, her voice breaking. It almost felt like she was about to burst out into tears. I mean, she was really, she was really reaching a very honest emotional core when she delivered this speech. And she was delivering the speech not as a Clinton surrogate, which she is, and not as the you know, first lady of the United States, as she is, but as an American woman and as a mother. And I think that's what made it such an impactful speech, especially for those de that demographic in America, too. Um, and it was in a previous speech where she came up with that powerful phrase, when they go low, we go high. And it's pithy, it's short, but it says it all. And it's a phrase that's become so powerful that even Hillary Clinton used it again in the most recent US presidential debate. But behind every effective speaker is usually an effective speechwriter. Um, this woman, she's only 38 years old, Sarah Hurwitz. She's a lawyer, she studied law, she was a Harvard graduate. She's been working with Michelle Obama since 2008 as her speechwriter. Um, and there was this great piece in the Washington Post profile on her that came out months ago before Michelle Obama's speech was really taken onto the international radar. And she said, as I write for her now, I'm sort of editing the speech with her voice in my head because she's given me so much feedback over the years and been so clear about what she wants. And I wanted to end it, this presentation with a picture of Sarah. And because not all of us, no one in this room, we're not going to be a first lady of the United States. We're not going to be able to command the international global stage and make it to the history books the way that Michelle Obama has. Or maybe there's an off chance, but likelihood is, is pretty not. But the likelihood is very, very high that each person in this room would be like Sarah Horowitz, that you will find yourself in a position that you will be able to craft and help be part of a team to make this really effective speech, whether it's for um, something in a newsroom, for a corporate executive, for a politician, for an activist group, um, for even a PR company, or even for yourself during that career-defining moment. You're going to find yourself in that position. So I'm just going to end my speech on how to give a speech right there, how to craft it, how to deliver it, getting over fear. And I hope some of the tips that I've gained over the years can help you out. So good luck. Questions, guys? Don't be shy. Um, I want to ask this. Uh, oh, I, I have two questions. The first one is uh, we gain confidence when we are when we know exactly what we're talking about and uh, when we know when we are from there familiar with it. But is there any 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 time in your career that if you are giving a speech that you are not that uh, confident about? And how do you com uh, com overcome that? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, there's, there's definitely many times in the past I've given dud speeches. Um, and I think one time it didn't help that I had um, food poisoning <laughs> right before I gave the speech. So I was visibly in a bad place. It was just not focused at all. Um, or even doubting yourself in the midst of your message, which is very dangerous. You, don't, you never want to do do the thing where you, you say, okay, I'm going to rip up the speech and do something completely different because I'm going to wow the audience. Because more likely than not, you're going to make a colossal mistake. I don't know if you remember about four years ago, it was at the Republican National Convention when um, Clint Eastwood addressed a chair, an empty chair, pretending that President Obama was sitting in it. But later on, when he gave an interview with a small town newspaper, I think it was the Arnold Pineco, he asked him, what were you thinking? And he said, well, I had a prepared address. I started thinking about Obama was there, an able president, and I thought maybe this would work, and even Clint Eastwood admitted, in the end, it didn't work. You want to stick with your message, right? Which is also, I mentioned earlier about Michelle Obama, when she gives her speeches, she also very, very, she doesn't order last minute changes. That's in the Washington Post, it says when they commit to a speech, she practices it, they stay with the message, and you don't want to do any last minute changes because you can really get into dodgy territory. Yeah. I'm Eric, so thanks very much for coming over. I have two questions, uh, actually. So the first question is, do you think there is actually any difference between you know, speaking in front of a camera as an anchor and giving a speech at, for example, the FCC, public speech at the FCC? 
And the second question is, do you think there is something called, you know, over-preparedness? You, can you over-prepare, you know, giving your speech? Oh, that second one is a great question because that's a charge that's been thrown at Hillary Clinton. My personal opinion is you can never be over-prepared. I don't know why being over-prepared is, is an attack point. I mean, I, I want, I, I would prefer to listen to someone who is over-prepared than under-prepared and winging it. Um, there is a big difference when I'm addressing the camera and I'm addressing a, um, it, 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 an audience um, that I'm not seeing on air and addressing an audience I'm seeing in flesh. Um, one thing is um, I have to imagine the person I'm talking to on the other side, so there's a little tiny bit of acting involved, um, whereas I can be much more, I can read your faces, I get these nonverbal modifiers if you're nodding your head or laughing or stone cold silence, so I can so I can work with the audience. So and that feedback is becomes part of your presentation as well when you're dealing with a live audience. Another key difference is you know, when I'm live on air, it's usually it's it's very prepared um, and right down to it's a multimedia presentation. So you have to line up in advance with your producers the the maps or the quote pilots or the video or sound bites or the package or what have you you're going to be working around and every single moment is blocked out um, whereas during this type of presentation it's it's much more free and there's a bit of to and fro with the audience yeah. yes. um, I could imagine that during like a live broadcast there have been like unexpected situations like yeah. how do you not freak out and keep them like going yeah um, I think one thing is you you you, you don't freak out because you think that you, you really have to keep it professional and keep it polished. Um, and also, it's live TV, and I think the audience get it's, enjoys the immediacy and it feels live when a mistake actually happens. Um, but they want to see how you recover. So, you know, it's, I'm just trying to think of an example there. Um, you know, so there was one time when I was live on air and I was doing a touch screen segment, and then the prompter stopped working, and I ended up ad-libbing, and I kept ad-libbing, and I kept ad-libbing, and no one in the control room was talking to me, and so then I said, I don't know what's gonna happen next, and I just tossed a break and I walked off the set. And then uh, later on I found out that someone had entered the control room and just commanded the attention and was telling these great jokes to the producers, <laughs> and I was left hanging. And the person later, yeah, the person later apologized. But, you know, that was probably a worst case scenario. But even then, to the audience, it looked fine because I continued with the point, and then I wrapped it and said, "We'll be back right after this." And I walked off camera as sort of a more of a gesture to the people in the control room, like, "Hey guys, what's going on? I want you to be able to see that I, you kind of left me hanging out here." But to the audience, it was like, "Oh, okay, that's a natural break." Um, I also think the audience can be very forgiving when there is a technical issue. You can say, you know, my apologies, you know, we, we lost that signal, but look, you know, she's reporting live from the outskirts of, of Mosul during the battlefield. You know, this is kind of expected, but this is important. We'll bring her up as soon as possible. Um, you know, being transparent. Uh, also, if there's a mistake, acknowledging the mistake and moving on and not getting embarrassed. Uh, about it at all, but acknowledging it, moving on, and say, okay, well, we've, this is what, what else we prepare for you. Let's move to this story what's happening in Russia this day. Yeah. Uh, first, come back. Uh, do you need to have a certain body shape as being an anchor? <laughs> <laughs> do you know what? I don't, I would say, I would say no. But then I have inherited my father's body shape, and I'm like six foot three in these ridiculous heels. Um, but there are a bit. I mean, we we work in an industry where there is increasingly a wide variety of body shapes, and there's diversity in body shapes, right, in the media. And I think that probably was it was a different situation a generation ago, where there wasn't much diversity when it came down to race down to um, even how someone looked. Um, I, mean, I was watching a panel on BBC, and one woman had blue hair, the other woman had purple hair. You know, it's, I can't imagine that happening a, a generation or two ago. Um, but, it, but it is important that you're aware of how to make the most, or 
that to the nurse, but to but to maximize how do you, how do how do you present yourself in the best light, right? Um, and you will you will learn that over time. Okay, this is going to be a bit embarrassing, but I'm going to go there. <laughs> so, so embarrassing. My 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 shoulders are more narrow than my hips. <laughs> when I wear certain certain um, outfits, it, it can make me look very very pear shaped. Okay, and this is something that I've learned. And I've learned to avoid those types of wardrobes because it would end up drawing attention to my body as opposed to my presentation. Right. This applies to every single person. Right. There's a reason why a lot of men wear tailored suits because it hides the big belly. Right. <laughs> so it's you know you just have to be. <laughs> I'm speaking frankly with all of you. Um, even when I was on air and I was pregnant when I was on air and there was one moment my senior producer pulled me aside and said, you know, Christy, you need to cover up here. And I didn't realize it, that my body was growing and I was changing. And it was becoming inappropriate. And not inappropriate, but it was drawing too much attention to an area when I want people to look up here, not down here. <laughs> okay? And I, it, I, it was an awkward conversation because this was a male senior producer. <laughs> But I knew what his intention, and he also handled it with delicacy. And I knew the reason why we were having this conversation, and then I wasn't aware of it. Right. So you don't have to be one type of body shape, but you have to be aware of your body shape. <laughs> That's the bottom line. Okay. Probing question there. Very probing question, but you know, I, I believe in honesty. So there we go. Get him on there. Uh, my name is Kenny, and we've been talking about broadcasting, but I kind of want to go back to the public speech. Yeah. Um, you talked about you encountered a stone-faced audience. So what do you do? Do you continue to pump them up, or do you just not cry? <laughs> yeah, I mean, sometimes it's sometimes it, it could be the fault of your speech, or sometimes it can be the fault of the person who's in the audience. Um, last year, when I addressed your students, there was this one female student who was asleep the entire time. <laughs> she was out. And what was really remarkable was at the end of the speech, she raised her hand and started asking questions. <laughs> and I thought, this woman has chutzpah. You know, I was like, wow, she's got guts. <laughs> and then even after the speech, she came up to me and said, Thank you very much. <laughs> I enjoyed that. And I was like, I'm so tempted to call her out in front of a professor, but that's not a cool thing to do, so I'm not going to do that. So, so you have to make that mental calculation. Sometimes it's you, sometimes it's them, right? She was just exhausted. Maybe she had an all night rager, or maybe she had like a 72 page essay that she just turned in. What have you? You know, just you, you, you learn how to calibrate, and also you're not going to be pleasing everyone. And you have to be okay with that. I don't think she's here today, though. <laughs> I wouldn't recognize her. Uh, first time, and then back. Uh, hi, Christy. Um, I want to ask you about tapping into authenticity. Yeah. Um, it seems to me that what you need to do is to get reach deep into your emotional core. But of course, as journalists, yeah. uh, we need to remain, as you say, authoritative and impartial. Yeah. How do you find a balance? Um, how do you ensure that you don't show off biases while still remaining authentic? Yeah, I think what's really that that's been that's been a, a major point of discussion during the selection cycle and also internally at CNN. And what, what's interesting is inside CNN we're, we're using this language, and I think you see it on air and the on the promotion that we're that we're putting on the screen is that it's not about achieving balance, but achieving um, truthfulness. And authenticity at the end of the day is not about you know your hipster cred. It's about are you being truthful, all right? Are you really pointing the camera at the place that people should be looking at, um, as opposed to for the sake of balance, let's fill in this additional three minutes on the opposing side saying something that's absolutely false, right? So it's it's pushing for truthfulness um, from from all corners, and uh, yeah, I think it, it, yeah. this was something you look up online, Jeff Zipper. <laughs> Head of CNN has talked about, um, you know, going back, looking at the way that we've covered the election, and 
amount of airtime that we've given to certain rallies, that it would have been more effective if, in addition to focusing the camera on the rallies, we also contextualized it. And which is why later on the election cycle you saw a lot of fact checking. Uh, fact checking by you know, moderators like Martha Raddatz and Anderson Cooper, fact checking segments being done uh, by CNN, by Washington Post, Reuters, other news agencies, you know, immediately fact checking tweets being sent out during a debate. Because it, I think there is that trend in journalism now. It's not, it's not about the pursuit of balance, but the, the, the pursuit of truthfulness. Bye. Uh, Christy, thank you for your sharing. My name is Chloe. You better project. Um, so I have uh, one question for you. Um, I was just wondering, like, for example, when you're interviewing some very high-profile guests or when you're addressing something that's very sensitive, the topic is very sensitive, and you realize you said something that might not be very appropriate, have you ever had uh, these experiences and how did you deal with it? Yeah, I mean, I think you have to work up to the moment. So, for example, I, I haven't seen this documentary yet, but there's this moment, there's this documentary that came out about Anna Wintour called uh, First Week in May about the Met Ball, and the documentary filmmaker used the moment of the interview that I did with her in Beijing for Talk Asia when I asked her about um, how she felt about the Devil Wars Prada and how you know, she was portrayed in that memoir and did she feel that she was betrayed. I didn't go into the interview and sat down, and that was the first question, right? You have to build up to that moment. You have to prove to her that you've done your research, um, that you get the you know, other questions out of the way, you build that camaraderie, that you build that trust, and then you have to think of a way of phrasing the question um, so it doesn't feel like a gotcha, I'm going to embarrass you, I want you to get angry on camera, we want to walk out on camera, but we want to hear your point on this. Know, this is out there, you know it's out there. You've probably been you know, forced to discuss it, you know, maybe not so much in public, but you know, maybe behind closed doors or, or, or with your confidants or, or family members. Could you share with us just your feelings about that? Because it's out there, right? Um, I did an interview with the um, Senior Vice President of Xiaomi, Hugo Barra, and we put together this touch screen segment where I was gonna bring up during the interview it was a taped interview on um, how Xiaomi's product design and marketing looks a lot like Apple product design and Apple marketing. And, um, and so we had concrete examples. And Hugo Barra being Hugo Barra, because he's such a nerd, was like, ooh, touch screen. I'm going to touch, touch, touch. And then he saw the slides. And he said, like, what are you doing to me? <laughs> and so then my producer and I had to talk him down. So we're like, look, it's out there. You know that people are discussing this, people are sharing this, and you have to have you have to respond to this. I mean, it's we're not going to not ask you the question. You know, we have a responsibility to represent people's you know, interest in you as a company, as a phenomenon, and you have a responsibility to answer them. You know, so it's you kind of come across that way, and then you say, okay, all right, I'm cool, I'm I'm cool about that. <laughs> all right, but you know, let's let's do it. And so you know, it's. It's, it's, sometimes it comes down to you just have to be a, you, you have to bring out your inner diplomat too. Um, and also I think, you know, one of my favorite interviewers is Terry Gross. I think she does it so well on uh, NPR and Fresh Air. She really gets into these really kind of deeply personal questions. And if you go deeply, deeply personal, you can also preface it with like, if you feel uncomfortable, you don't have to answer it. Um, if it's, if it's going to be going into an area that's really, really personal. And I think if, if you build up trust and camaraderie during the interview, more often than not, they'll feel willing to open up to you because they trust you and respect your work. Yeah. We may have time for problems to get you out at 12.30. Oh, yeah, gosh, it's already 12.30. Yeah, we have any time for photos. Oh, yeah, of course. Okay, well, I have time for another question or two, and then yeah. we'll take what photos you want. Okay. One here. Um, so I'm oh. guessing as an anchor, you've had a bit of experience with breaking news. Yeah. And um, you said practice is really key. It's good to stick to your message, not have any last minute changes. But breaking news is all about last minute. Oh yeah, absolutely. So how would you practice for breaking news? You can always practice for breaking news because in journalism, you learn the art of pattern recognition and anticipating events. So, and you cover so many earthquakes, airplane disasters, train collisions, political protests, um, and you keep reading up on what's happening in South Korea or South Africa or U.S. elections. So if something does flare up, you know the context of the story. 
So last night, right when we started, we went on air, Rocky Forces finally ended Mosul. I mean, this is something we waited for for two weeks. And yes, it was breaking news. Were we caught unawares? Was I caught unaware? No, of course not. Because we've been prepping and reading and reporting on this every single day. And even before the operation began, we were talking about um, you know, the use of human shields, about the humanitarian concerns, about more displaced Iraqis, about you know, who's involved in the fight, about what this means for ISIS in Iraq, what it means for ISIS in the caliphate across Iraq and Syria. So you can carry the story forward, right? So, uh, you, of course, there's a little bit of wiggle room, right? You never know about the timing, but the more you read, the more you know, and the more you can anticipate a story is going to break. And uh, I'm sorry, but uh, impromptu, I've been told that we actually have to vacate the room for another class, so we won't have any time for another question. But maybe we can just move outside if anybody wanted to just follow you to the MTR. Or <laughs> take, <laughs> don't take any photos with you outside. I'm sure if you can get you to hang anyway, around for a couple I, minutes. So. I hope that was helpful, and I really wish you guys the best of luck. Let's say a, one last thank you and goodbye.